Inside the Magic, show number 391 for October 1st, 2012. by Disney vacations are amazing carefree family experiences with memories that will last a lifetime and 2013 itineraries are now available you can lay away your vacation today and receive up to a $500 Visa gift card when you book an Adventures by Disney destination vacation you're going to want to do that by calling Magical Travel at 866-207-8387 or visit them online at MagicalTravel.com to receive a free price quote and be sure to mention Inside the Magic to receive your free Disney gift card for qualifying bookings when you book your Disney vacation with Magical Travel. And, uh, of course, uh, thanks very much to uh, listeners and viewers like you and uh, anybody making a single donation, monthly recurring donation, or anyone clicking through those uh, links, affiliate links over on our website, uh, particularly Amazon.com. Anytime you're shopping through there, click through the link first. We get credit for that. Helps support the show and i thank you very 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 much for that and now let's get started with our trip around the world So we'll definitely have an Epcot flair throughout the show this week, from the news to uh, actually talking about Epcot itself, and all the way through the listener feedback, you'll be enjoying some familiar tunes from around uh, Epcot, and plenty of details from a very special celebration of this 30th anniversary. Uh, this is why I'm actually recording the show uh, for Monday, October 1st, rather than uh, for Sunday, like I normally do, because Monday, October 1st, well, the Monday part's not important, but October 1st, 2012, is the official uh, 30th anniversary date for Epcot. Of course, it's also an anniversary for uh, Walt Disney World in general, opened it back in uh, 1971 on October 1st. That's a big day for Disney history out here at Walt Disney World. Many, many attractions have opened on October 1st, but uh, specifically, the big celebration for this year is the 30th anniversary of Epcot, which, of course, I've said several times now, and and uh, we'll be talking uh, much, much more about as the show progresses here. But before we get to that, uh, I do have some other news to share. Not a whole lot of other news, actually, this week. Uh, some little tidbits here and there is still very interesting. And even before we get to all of that, uh, I do have a very fun voice message to share here. As I mentioned on last week's show, I had uh, I, I was recording the show very late at night, uh, and in the beginning, the early hours of, uh, of anniversary, uh, my wife and I uh, had our wedding anniversary, and we had a great time. We went to Citrico's for dinner, first time we'd ever dined there. Probably do a review of that and some other uh, some other restaurants I've tried for the first time recently around Walt Disney World. Uh, be doing those soon here on the show. In short great meal. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, but to go alongside that, uh, when we got home, I actually had received a very, very interesting voice message from a couple of familiar voices uh, wishing us a happy anniversary, and I thought I would share it here just because I thought it was such a special message that was uh, awaiting us when we returned from Citrico's. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, dear Ricky Michelle. <laughs> that almost rhymed. Happy anniversary to you. <laughs> Yours, me and Mixer, hope you have a happy anniversary, Ricky. That's right. Gosh, we sure love your show. Yep, we sure do. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us inside the magic. And we 
sure hope you have a magical anniversary. That's right, Goof. Happy anniversary, Ricky. And happy anniversary, Michelle. Well, thanks very much, uh, Goofy and uh, and Mickey and and whoever arranged for uh, for Goofy and Mickey to uh, to leave us a message wishing us a happy anniversary. Thank you uh, very much to to whoever you are out there. Uh, it definitely brought a smile to both of our faces when we heard that. Uh, listened to it several times over, and uh, just thought I would share that with everybody. Definitely a, a fun message there. So, with that out of the way, let's jump into uh, into this week's news, starting over at the Magic Kingdom, where Storybook Circus seems to be uh, progressing quite nicely. Uh, various bits and pieces are opening up little by little as it moves closer and closer to the completion of Storybook Circus. The latest uh, bit to open is uh, none other than uh, Big Top Souvenirs, which is, uh, of course, the, the merchandise location of Storybook Circus, where you'll find uh, plenty of, well, exactly what you would expect in a location like this. Uh, lots of Dumbo merchandise, lots of Storybook Circus merchandise, and of course a variety of other uh, Disney merchandise, the usual array of things that uh, actually opened uh, just uh, just yesterday, September 30th, and uh, it features Big Top Treats as well, which has uh, goodies, as, uh, as Disney puts it, including uh, cotton candy, caramel apples, uh, Goofy's Glaciers, beverages, and, uh, and more. And, uh, of course, there's plenty of apparel and toys and dolls and plush and uh, all of that kind of good stuff. Pins, Vinylmation, uh, D-Tech, and a variety of, uh, of things. And there's even a, a Storybook Circus t-shirt that has Humphrey the Bear on it. So you Humphrey fans out there will be uh, excited to hear that. Uh, it is just one small part of the greater picture that is Storybook Circus with uh, Pete's Silly Sideshow sure to open up pretty soon. Uh, not quite ready yet, but also going on at Storybook Circus is uh, interesting. There's another tent out there that uh, sort of people have been wondering, hmm, what is that yellow tent? What is that going to house? And apparently it has some a uh, little bit of food in the area, but also fast pass distribution for uh, Barnstormer, and uh, I think Dumbo is in there as well. So they're uh, really working on ways of uh, sort of moving fast pass and its uh, appropriate places and getting everybody to flow all the way through storybook circus etc etc so uh as i said things are definitely moving on over there uh to a uh to a finale uh which i imagine will open up sometime between now and november 19th which is that uh, that magical date with the uh, when previews officially begin for uh for new fantasy land uh, speaking of previews though uh, it was posted on the official walt disney world uh, annual pass holder facebook page that they will be emailing all walt disney world annual pass holders uh the announcement the invitation to sign up for uh, the limited uh, access uh, annual pass holder previews of New Fantasyland in early November. They'll be sending those emails very, very soon. They said early October, so it could be any day now, any minute now, in fact. Uh, so be sure to watch your emails or check the pass holder site. Uh, there will only be so many slots available for people to sign up for that, so definitely stay on top of it. And, uh, and I look forward to uh, exploring all of the various areas a little bit early of, uh, of New Fantasyland. On a completely different spectrum entirely, of course, last week I talked all about uh, Halloween, and this week uh, shows almost completely free of Halloween, though I can't ignore it completely, because this is uh, October, after all, and I have to talk just a little bit about it uh, every single week, uh, just uh, just because it is my favorite time of the year, but not nearly as extensively la as last week. So we're going to jump uh, back over to uh, good old Universal Orlando for uh, just a small tidbit about Halloween Horror Nights. This is actually not even a, really a scary part of it, but something really interesting that they're doing this year that is brand new called Horror Unearthed. And uh, this horror unearthed, uh, it's sort of a game. Uh, it, you basically, uh, you show up and uh, to the event and you grab a, uh, you register, you can register online, you can register right there. Uh, you pick one of, uh, of a few uh, legions, as they're calling them. Uh, and uh, once you've joined that, there are six different ones. You can then uh, pick up a pass card there uh, in the park. And that pass card allows you to uh, basically scan uh, using RFID technology, very similar to what Disney's been working on as well. You you tap it against these horror unearthed uh, kiosks. Not really kiosks, but these little sort of scanners. Uh, outside the different houses, they said they're going to put them throughout the, the park and then with different characters. It's going to be these tasks that they put online that you'll have to follow. The uh, first tasks included uh, just simply visiting all seven haunted houses in a single night or visiting the haunted houses in a certain order and you get extra points towards your legion and etc, etc. It's all just in fun. I don't think there's any real prizes 
that you can win, but it is uh, certainly a, uh, a fun way to keep uh, those frequent fear pass holders coming back and looking for more out of Halloween Horror Nights. I definitely look forward to going back several times with my horror unearthed pass card to uh, to try that out uh, even more. It's a it's good little free fun addition to the event. So now let's uh, jump away from Universal Orlando on over to uh, to Downtown Disney, where quite a few things were going on this weekend. Uh, some were surprises to me, and others were uh, certainly announced and planned. The surprise, as I was walking through uh, Downtown Disney just the other night, was spotting the brand new Characters in Flight balloon. Of course, if you remember, I I'm not even sure if I mentioned it here on the show or not, a few weeks ago, Aerofile. Uh, the company who operates the Characters in Flight balloon uh, at Downtown Disney, along with many other uh, similar balloons around the world, had a safety issue with one of their balloons overseas somewhere. Uh, it uh, I can't remember the details at the moment, but it ended up sort of falling to the ground, which is not a good thing, uh, certainly. So they uh, stopped operating the one here in Orlando temporarily, and in the meantime, they actually uh, had a whole new balloon made, apparently. It's uh, fantastic looking. It looks much better than the other one. It has Tinkerbell on the side, along with some other characters still, uh, but it is a nicer uh, looking balloon in general, sort of these orange and red stripes and some blue highlights and just a fancier looking design. Uh, I really like it, so I think it has uh, has spruced that up nicely. And while I was at Downtown Disney, uh, a surprise to me, uh, I actually met up with somebody who's uh, a listener uh, named Garrett, whose son, Brian, uh, was sporting a pair of Oswald ears that he had just purchased that day at Animal Kingdom. That's right, the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit ears have finally made their way out here to Walt Disney World. He got them in Animal Kingdom, but I've also heard they're over at the store I was just talking about a little while ago, uh, Big Top Souvenirs uh, at, uh, at the Magic Kingdom, which is certainly an appropriate place for them, and I imagine they'll be showing up all over the place very soon. Uh, from what I understand, they sold out fairly quickly, uh, at least in Animal Kingdom, as one of the first places that they were available, but, uh, you know, just keep checking back, and uh, I haven't had a chance to pick up my own Oswald the Lucky Rabbit ear hat, uh, ear hat, really, uh, yet, but I most certainly will very soon. And uh, continuing with Downtown Disney, this weekend was something special called Frankenweenie Weekend. Of course, in honor of uh, Tim Burton's upcoming film, it opens this coming Friday, October 5th, uh, Frankenweenie, which is, uh, you know, I saw a screening of Frankenweenie just a few days ago. It was a, a press advance screening. I can't talk about it right now, unfortunately. I'm, uh, I've got an embargo on my thoughts until just a few days from now. What I can say at the moment is go see it. Trust me. Take that for what you will. Uh, I, I guess I can say it was an excellent movie. I, I have to leave it at that, though. I can't offer my full review, uh, my full thoughts until until next week's show, or actually just a couple of days from now on the uh, on the website. So if you're really eager to know my thoughts, uh, of course I'll post a spoiler-free review over on InsideTheMagic.net, and then I'll I'll talk about it more on uh, on next week's show. But anyway, back to Downtown Disney. Uh, Frank and Weenie Weekend included a variety of uh, activities that were available. There was a Frank and Weenie sort of photo op set up outside the AMC theater there, which has a bit of the uh, sort of cemetery, uh, uh, back on New Holland Cemetery. Uh, in addition, projected onto the side of the AMC Theater was uh, sort of a moon with Sparky the dog on it and the Frank and Weenie logo. Most importantly, though, Jack Skellington and Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas were doing their first ever meet and greet at Walt Disney World. Of course, they've met and greeted with <laughs> with uh, guests at uh, Disneyland uh, from Haunted Mansion Holiday for a number of years now, but this is the first time they've ever appeared at Walt Disney World, and it was a tremendous turnout. Uh, it was from 6 to 11 p.m. Uh, each night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and literally hundreds of of people showed up. I heard wait times of up to three hours to meet this uh, pair of characters. Certainly there is a demand. Of course, it helps that it was a downtown Disney and it was free. You didn't need theme park admission, but there was certainly a demand for this meet and greet, and I hope that tells Disney that Jack and Sally are important characters and that we want to see more of them out here uh, in Orlando. I'll be posting more photos and uh, and some video of Jack and Sally soon over at InsideTheMagic.net. Also part of Frank and Weenie Weekend were uh, some special uh, treats that they were offering including uh, Frank and Weenie, uh, hot dogs, basically, and uh, also some uh, some special fusion uh, lemonade, uh, the Franken-fusion lemonade that had a glowing ice cube in it. Naturally, um, I did not 
get those. Uh, the hot dog was seven dollars, and I didn't think I needed to pay seven dollars for a uh, a hot dog. But uh, that aside, still fun, and uh, certainly uh, some good times out of downtown Disney. Uh, like I said, for anybody who just wanted to show up, and it was uh, it was free. Continuing with the Frank and Weenie theme here, moving away from downtown Disney in promotion of Frank and Weenie, um, Disney's hit mobile game Where's My Water has debuted a new free variation uh, that is uh, part of the ten days of uh, or it is the 10 Days of Frank and Me level pack that was launched a few days ago. It has a sparky cameo, theme music inspired by the film, and it is, uh, of course, a version of that popular Where's My Water game for, uh, for iPod Touch and iPhone and iPad and all that good stuff. So uh, you can download that for free over in the uh, the iTunes store. One more Frank and Weenie note here in anticipation of the film. Disney Publishing Worldwide has also uh, released for free Frank and Weenie, an electrifying book for the iPad. It's available on the iBook store and uh, it integrates uh, videos and music and sketches and behind the scenes look at the making of. Uh, it is uh, Disney Publishing's first project created with Apple's iBooks uh, author software. So you can grab that for free as well. Continuing with the topic of uh, movies, though something entirely different than uh, Frank and Weenie and uh, and Tim Burton, and that is uh, Walt Disney, uh, Disney Studios' Disney Nature label has uh, announced its film that will be hitting the big screen in spring of 2014. It's going to be called Bears, and as you can imagine, it's... It's about bears. Uh, it's not about the bears from uh, from Brave, though. It's about uh, bears in Alaska. And, uh, well, you can imagine what else it would be about. Uh, just the, you know, same as similar movies like African Cats and Chimpanzee that have come out recently. Well, this one will be bears. And sticking with the world of movies, just for a couple of more news stories here. These are a couple of Blu-ray release uh, releases that have been announced uh, upcoming. One will be Peter Pan Diamond Edition. That'll be available for a limited time on uh, Blu-ray coming out. Uh, and I don't even have the release date in front of me. That probably would help, wouldn't it? I swear I had it in my notes. And then it vanished. And so I am looking it up as I speak. And I am stalling. And I'm just going to keep talking until I come up with a date. And I don't have one. So uh, there is no date. Uh, it says available for a limited time in the email that I received. And for some reason, there's no date. So we'll just take that for what it is now. And I'm sure there's a date out there somewhere. Uh, and, and that aside, I do have a date for this next one that I am excited about. Uh, Dick Tracy. Great movie. Uh, that will be coming out for the first time on Blu-ray and digital copy with a new digital restoration. That one is coming out December 11th. See, I have a date for something at least uh i, I swear i'll find out the uh, the peter pan date uh, maybe they haven't even announced it yet who knows anyway uh that'll actually do it for your news from around the world this week And today's tip uh, goes along with that little bit of Halloween theme here. It comes in from David, who writes, Here's a little tip for the folks planning on dressing up for Mickey's not-so-scary Halloween party. Dress with a 90s nostalgia theme. A good amount of cast members are college students who grew up in the 90s, and they will appreciate the nostalgia and possibly give you more candy. I went last year dressed as Quail Man from Doug, and uh, my sister was a purple parrot from the Legends of the Hidden Temple. Uh, David, excellent, excellent tip. I love your costume ideas there. I certainly uh, grew up watching Doug and Legends of the Hidden Temple and Olmec, of course, voiced, uh, voiced by Dee Bradley Baker, who's done so many voices for uh, Disney and beyond over the years. A very talented guy. Uh, uh, those shows definitely have a special place uh, with me, so a great idea. 90s nostalgia. You can't go wrong there. Uh, everyone else out there, email your tips to tips at insidethemagic.net <laughs> And now here's something new that we've never done here on the show. It's time for a little dance break. This uh, dance break on Inside the Magic is actually brought to you by the new game, Just Dance Disney Party. Not out quite yet. This number one dance game brand, Just Dance, 
meets the magical world of Disney and the newest and coolest video game for the whole family, Just Dance Disney Party. You can dance to songs from some of your favorite beloved Disney classic movies like Little Mermaid, of course you're hearing in the background here, Beauty and the Beast, Jungle Book, and Cinderella. Plus, you can dance along to songs from the coolest Disney Channel shows like Shake It Up, Ant Farm, Jesse and Phineas and Ferb. It's perfect for kids of all ages. Just Disney Dance Party is a great way to keep the family active. The uh, non-stop shuffle features, uh, uh, or let, rather the non-stop shuffle feature, lets kids dance continuously to their favorite songs. Uh, Just Dance Disney Party will be available for Connect for the Xbox 360 and on the Wii on October 23rd, just uh, about three weeks from now, for $29.99 available at all major retailers. So now I'll throw you back to Under the Sea for a little more dancing fun. Epcot's 30th anniversary, as this music may have clued you in, one of my favorite songs uh, played around Epcot. Of course, this is part of the Dancing Fountain of Nations, uh, something that I always, I could just sit here and listen to the whole song, but I have things to talk about first. Uh, more specifically, I just attended the uh, special D23 uh, uh, special event, the uh, separately ticketed event held in the World Showplace over at uh, at Epcot, naturally, in honor of the 30th anniversary of, uh, of Epcot. World Showplace, of course, was developed uh, back for the uh, Millennium Celebration of uh, Epcot has stuck around for many, many special events over the years, and it was a perfect place for uh, D23 to hold their uh, special event inside. Uh, unfortunately, though it was a wonderful day of, uh, of presentations, a full day uh, from about 9 in the morning till about 6 p.m. with a little bit of uh, breaks in between, great presentations, I can tell you all about them. I can even share uh, some photos along the way, but I can't actually share the presentations themselves with you. Uh, no video was allowed, no audio recording, no recording of any sort, and even photography was limited in some cases. So best I can do is uh, tell you a little bit about the notes that I took, what went on during this presentation, and uh, I was able to interview some of the panelists, which was uh, pretty fascinating. Talk to the people who were there and instrumental in the making of Epcot 30 years ago. What I can share with you first right now is the introduction that was offered as uh, as part of this uh, of this event. I was allowed to film uh, about the first 10 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less, of the presentation that began with a, a special introductory video, sort of introducing uh, the history of Epcot and the event, followed by a few words from head of D23, Stephen Clark. Uh, so that's what I want to share with you now. Let him introduce all of this, and then I'll go into some details about uh, what was said, what was most interesting, what was most fun about this special event. So I'm going to turn it over now, over to Epcot in the World Showplay. Two, D23 head Stephen Clark.
Houston boys and girls, welcome to D23's Epcot 30th Anniversary Celebration. Please welcome your host and the head of D23, Stephen Clark. Hello, everyone. Good morning. On behalf of everyone at D23, the official Disney fan club, welcome to our celebration of the dawn of a new Disney era. It's great to see so many diehard Epcot fans with us today. Uh, this, there we are, there's one of them. Uh, this particular park holds a very special place in Disney history and in the hearts of countless Disney fans like all of us. Not only for its forward-thinking innovations, but also because thanks to Epcot, we all know that the 21st century really began on October 1st, 1982. As I'm sure you're all aware, as I hope you're all aware, EPCOT is an acronym for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. The word community is what's key, considering the impact this park has made on so many people from around the world who have joined together over the past three decades to celebrate man and his future world. But it was also the notion of community that allowed EPCOT to be built in the first place. After all, it was thanks to literally a community of tens of thousands. Imagineers, artists, artisans, architects, construction workers, operation experts, designers, chefs, musicians, composers, writers, and many, many others who came together to make one man's dream a reality here in Central Florida. So, to bring you the most detailed look at the evolution of Epcot ever presented by the Walt Disney Company, our team from D23 and the Walt Disney Archives have scoured our collections, our warehouses, and our files, and have spent literally months researching and preparing content that, for the most part, has never been seen or heard by the public before until today. Yes. <laughs> we guarantee that you are going to see and learn things that you've never known before about Epcot, and we are really excited to share these discoveries with you today. If you're inspired by everything that you learned today, please remember I'm Stephen Clark, the head of D23. <laughs> and if you don't learn anything new at all, then I'm Stephen Vagnini, the head of research for the Walt Disney Archives. <laughs> and uh, you can give me your feedback after the meeting. I look a little different, but it's fine. Actually, seriously, Stephen Vagnini has done a fantastic job of spearheading today's event. Let's give him a round of applause. Now, our friends at Walters and the Imagineering have also been very instrumental in helping make this celebration a reality, and we owe them a great big round of applause as a show of our thanks and appreciation. And tomorrow, right here at World Showplace, D23 will be hosting additional presentations uh, that, will, that, our, that all of our Epcot Park guests will be able to attend. And these presentations will feature Disney legend uh, Marty Sklar and other uh, partners from Imagineering. And they'll be completely different from what you've seen today. So we invite you to join us for those as well if you happen to be in the park. However, what you're going to experience today has been created exclusively for you. So to kick off our day, I was thinking it might be kind of fun to reach back to 1982. Uh, does anyone remember world key information inside Earth Station and throughout that thought center? Well, World Key Information represented the forward-thinking innovations of Epcot, as it allowed guests to video conference, imagine that, video conference, with cast members to make reservations, have their questions answered, and to learn about various subjects about their future world. So just for fun, let's reboot World Key Information and see if it still works. Hopefully it'll work. Here we go. Okay, toke aki para en pensar. Okay, I'm going to read off a, a list of menus, uh, subjects, uh, and the one that receives the loudest applause will be our first presentation for today. So here we go. So, number one, dining reservations. I hear it's really hard nowadays to get a reservation at Le Cellier, so let's see about that one. Uh, number two, Adventures with Duffy the Bear. So cute. <laughs> Making of the Epcot Millennial, Millennium Wand. Yeah! Aha, uh -huh, the Millennial Memories. 
And four, lastly, A New Disney Era with Marty Sklar. Well, I think we have a clear winner, so ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice round of applause to Disney legend and Epcot pioneer, Marty Sklar. And unfortunately, I can't share with you the uh, Marty Sklar presentation that uh, Stephen Clark there was referring to at the end, but I can tell you about what it was all about. Marty, uh, unfortunately, was uh, not able to be at uh, at this uh, this event in person because he was uh, he was off at his house for a, uh, a fundraiser that he holds every year. Uh, he'll actually be uh, at Epcot for the uh, special uh, uh, public. You know, for all park guests presentation today on October 1st. Um, but uh, for this special Epcot uh, uh, event, the D23, a separately ticket event, he was not there. So he uh, chimed in via video, via pre-recorded video. And despite the fact that he was on video, he uh, gave a rather uh, exciting and, and interesting presentation. He talked, of course, really beginning it all with uh, the history of uh, Epcot and thinking back to when uh, Epcot was Walt's vision, Walt Disney's vision of uh, being a experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Uh, you know, going back to the early days of the planning of what uh, what Walt believed Epcot could be, uh, with the notion of people movers and monorails moving people around the community from work to play to home, uh, etc. And uh, of course, there's that famous uh, Epcot video uh, that everybody's seen, uh, who is a Disney fan, an Epcot fan of Walt Disney, sort of going over the basics of what Epcot uh, is. And uh, Marty actually wrote that video, uh, rather the the script for that film for uh, Walt. Disney to read, and uh, there were actually two versions, according to uh, to Marty, about uh, what was shot. Uh, one was for the public, one was for investors. Uh, uh, so they showed a, a few clips of that at uh, at the presentation uh, at the uh, the D twenty three event. And uh, unfortunately, as Marty mentioned, uh, six weeks after filming that, uh, Walt Disney passed away. Uh, Marty said it was the last thing he would ever do on film. And at that point, Disney didn't know what to do with that Epcot project. They created the Epcot forums, uh, featuring in industry and creative people, including uh, Ray Bradbury, a famous uh, author, and uh, the notion of sort of people trusting Mickey Mouse was thrown out there, and they thought, well, you know, we can use this Epcot concept to communicate important issues and hot topics with people, but in an interesting sort of interactive and uh, entertaining way, this whole notion of uh, edutainment, if you will. They, of course, wanted to split it up between uh, sort of the pavilions about science and life and all of that, and then the what ultimately became the World Showcase. Originally, it was going to be two sort of half circles facing each other, and then they eventually came to the uh, the idea that uh, of what Epcot as a theme park is today, and. Um you know, of course, they had their issues with, with sponsors along the way, trying to land them, decide who went where. And uh, ultimately, Marty actually said this one uh, this, this, uh, particular comment stuck out as uh, uh, to me during the presentation that the land pavilion, uh, as it stands today at Epcot, was uh, what he thinks is probably the closest to what Walt's original vision of Epcot would have been. Be just in that, you know, you, walk, you, you, you go through on the boat, you see the greenhouse, you see sort of the self-sustaining nature of growing their own produce and uh, other food, which then gets uh, used right there in Epcot and uh, throughout Walt Disney World, actually, uh, to, to feed guests. And sort of that notion is as close as they got to what Walt was envisioning for those who would have lived uh, in Epcot. Uh, Marty also noted that they realized that they couldn't teach any particular topic really at length with any of their uh, their presentations, their attractions, their shows, uh, that really they had maybe 20 to 30 minutes tops to deliver anything on a topic, so they would really want to get people excited about the topics, but not really fully um, teach them, which I thought was uh, a pretty interesting uh, note there. It certainly makes sense as you ride through uh, a variety of things at Epcot. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's uh, sort of Marty Sklar's uh, a virtual presentation uh, via video in a nutshell. Uh, moving on to presentation number two, it was called We Can Do It. And this uh, had a rather large panel of uh, some of the older gentlemen in the Disney uh, community who some have retired, some are still with the Disney company, some have moved on to other companies, but they all played important roles in the uh, creation of Epcot. And I should note here that I'm not going to go through every little tiny detail of every presentation here. I've written up uh, even more detail over at InsideTheMagic.net, included, posted, uh, I think, over 200 photos from the event. So if you want uh, even more detail than I could possibly go into here on this 
podcast uh, or this show, uh, head on over to the website and check out that full uh, full article. What I will share here uh, is a, a three uh, particular interviews that I'm not going to share anywhere else. I'm not going to transcribe them. I'm not going to put them up by themselves. They are going to be exclusive to this show. And they are interviews with three of the uh, the guys who were uh, sort of uh, a part of a variety of panels that uh, I'll be talking about here. And I'm going to share those interviews in just a little bit after I sort of run through uh, all of these uh, presentation summaries. So anyway, this second uh, presentation was called We Can Do It because that was sort of the slogan, the motto that Disney had embodied uh, in order to really move beyond Walt Disney's death and decide what are we going to do about Epcot? Well, whatever it is, we can do it. We can build it. We can make it happen. We don't know what it is yet, but we can do it and we can finish it. And that was what really drove them. So uh, this presentation was uh, moderated quite loosely by Imagineer Jason Sorrell, who's always, of course, trying to be the comedian on stage, uh, sometimes very successfully, sometimes not so much. Uh, but in this case, he was quite outnumbered by uh, the other folks who really took the uh, panel uh, upon themselves to just uh, chit chat and talk all about the early days of Epcot. Uh, this included Duncan Dixon, uh, Bob Matheson, Jim McCaskill, Tom uh, Nabby, uh, Charlie Ridgway, Howard Rowland, and Bill Sullivan. You may uh, or may not recognize all of those names, but they did all play important roles in uh, the uh, the creation of Epcot, really. Not so much uh, the design, but the actual creation and the opening of Epcot. And they talked about a variety of sort of problems that they ran into uh, in constructing it. For instance, uh, apparently the uh, lagoon that we know is the World Showcase Lagoon today uh, basically was a big pile of muck, as Charlie Ridgway put it, and they had to pump that muck out out and uh, left with a lagoon. The muck incidentally went over to Caribbean Beach or where Caribbean Beach is now, that site, uh, to which Jason Sorrell joked, it's a perfectly lovely hotel. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, while they were sort of building the lagoon and the monorail uh, beams that were going around it, they actually lost about seven of, uh, of the pylons that they were driving in there to, uh, to, to be part of the monorail system. These were 120-foot pylons, so uh, you know, losing them into this, this mucky sort of not quite Lagoon is uh, one of those interesting and bizarre obstacles that uh, that you run into when you're building something on the size and the scale of a theme park like uh, Epcot. Of course, uh, by the time it opened, uh, they had been around the park so many times that uh, Charlie Ridgway also mentioned that he was touring press around that morning, and he estimated that he had been around the World Showcase somewhere between 30 and 40 times that opening morning, which is, a, uh, they said, a little over a mile in distance. So that must have been uh, fairly exhausting. Uh, and of course, there were many other uh, interesting and amusing stories shared as well. Uh, in the interest of time here, I won't share too many more of those. Uh, we'll just kind of move on to the next presentation. As I said, you can head on over to the website uh, to read a little bit more about uh, all of that. The next presentation was called Looking Back at Tomorrow. Unfortunately, this one, like many Walt Disney Archives presentations, no photography was allowed. Of course, no video, as I said earlier, was allowed anywhere uh, other than that introduction that I shared just a little bit ago. Um, but uh, uh, So I can't offer any, uh, any photography to go with this presentation, but it was hosted by uh, Walt Disney Archivist Stephen Bagnini and Michael Crawford. Uh, incidentally, Michael Crawford, uh, who is is, I believe Progress City USA on Twitter was actually tweeting live from up on stage though he didn't really make that known but anyone following him <laughs> sort of noticed that and he took a picture of the crowd while he was up there pretty amusing there uh, this whole presentation was really for diehard Epcot fans um, it was uh, showing uh, early world showcase drawings for the first time uh, how the Epcot logos came to be um, the evolution of uh, that old interactive robot smart one and ultimately becoming smart two which never made it in to the parks, which was uh, interesting to hear. There were some characters, really amusing characters that never made it into the parks either. There was supposed to be a, a mascot for a communicor called the Communicat. That was created by Exitensio, uh, Imagineer. Uh, that never happened. Another really interesting character for the Living Seas was kind of a response to Dreamfinder and Figment, that the uh, sponsor for the Living Seas was like, hey, we want a cool, cute, humorous character as well. So John Henge, sort of tongue-in-cheek, came up with Captain Saltyhinder and his pet mackerel that he could walk around with, kind of a high-tech, deep-water version of Dreamfinder and a mackerel Figment, as he put it, and he drew up some sketches of that, and clearly that went 
absolutely nowhere. Uh, another very amusing bit from this presentation were the v variety of names that were given for uh, sort of suggestions of what they would call the different pavilions around Future World. Instead of World of Motion, uh, they may have been called the Transportation Pavilion or Transways or Trans Center or the American Cavalcade of Transportation or even, uh, I may even not be able to say this one, the Transpost Sanctorium. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing it wasn't called that one. Uh, some more amusing suggestions they weren't really serious about was Guzzle-Rama, legroom rama and maybe even stick shift rama uh, for the land. I particularly like this one, actually. They may have called it Avant Gardens. Kind of like the sound of that. Uh, Harvest Tomorrow, another possible title. Terrorama, Land Alive, Nature Scope. Uh, some odd, odd names there. Uh, they talked a lot about Horizons. Horizons was an ongoing theme throughout uh, this whole D23 event. In fact, you're hearing Horizons music in the background right now. Uh, everybody loves Horizons. Everybody who's an Epcot fan loved, loved Horizons. I certainly did. And, and pretty much every presentation throughout this mentioned Horizons at one point. And in this case, they said that Century 3 was a proposed name of Horizons. In fact, they even uh, released a special bit of merchandise for this event with a Century 3 logo on it. And of course, I had to uh, get that t-shirt future probe was another name that didn't quite make it for uh, for horizons and then ultimately at the end of this presentation they showed all three endings from the choose your own ending from horizons in perfect pristine condition i would love to get my hands on that video but uh, they showed them all on the big screen in there in the world show place and everybody really really enjoyed that uh, moving on to the next presentation this is one of those ones where there's not a lot to say about it it's called epcot on film it was very entertaining uh but it was just clips of things and it was hosted by a uh, tim o tim o'day uh who was always uh, quite uh, entertaining he was here on the show a, co a couple of weeks ago and uh, he was joined by imagineer bob garner who had a variety of uh, roles throughout the years at disney and uh, in this case most interesting of all the clips that they showed in this presentation was a original sort of audition Audition or screen test for Figment, in which Garner uh, was uh, was essentially um, well testing whether or not a puppet version of Figment would be better than an animatronic version of Figment, and had a really bad voice at the time for uh, for the character. But at the same time, he was just uh, showing off how he thought the puppet version of Figment would be uh, would be a better uh, idea. And uh, he also noted that uh, he, apparently he, Bob Garner, was the one responsible for creating that famous shot of Mickey Mouse standing on the top of Spaceship Earth uh, with the helicopter flying overhead and Mickey Mouse is waving. Apparently it was very dangerous and that they hadn't quite uh, worked out all the details there and they were very lucky that it all uh, came across as smoothly as it did and he was glad he was not uh, fired for it. <laughs> and, and that is always a good thing. So uh, then there was a bit of a break, a uh, lunch break, a couple hours actually, and uh, when everybody returned, it was time for for Imagineer Comedy Hour. Uh, anybody who went to Destination D or uh, any of the other sort of recent events uh, will be familiar with the trio of Jason Sorrell, Jason Grant, and Alex Wright, the Imagineers who certainly do great work uh, as they're working on a variety of projects, but whenever they get up on stage, it turns into the Imagineering Three Stooges, apparently. I, uh, I would love to know the percentage of jokes and ad-libs in this presentation versus the amount of actual content they had prepared. It probably would be a fairly unbalanced amount. Uh, the jokes, I, I wouldn't say, were necessarily quite as funny as usual, but uh, it's always amusing to hear them uh, up on stage. But they did manage to sort of go through some interesting... Uh, the point of their presentation was to look at the close-up details of things that are around Epcot today, and even a little bit of the history and how those details came to be. They singled out one uh, interesting notion of Spaceship Earth when that was being designed. Uh, some engineers said there's no way we can't levitate a giant geodesic dome like that. It's impossible. Well, John Hench took it upon himself, legendary uh, Imagineer and designer John Hench, and decided that he would just uh, draw out a quick little sketch and say, no, it's possible. Here's how we're going to do it. And he basically said the upper 75% of Spaceship Earth is going to sit on a table or a platform while the lower uh, portion of Spaceship Earth is going to be, or 25% uh, will be suspended. And that's ended up exactly what they did, which was pretty interesting. Uh, anybody who's following uh, as I said, these Imagineers who have given multiple presentations uh, over the past few years at D23 events will be familiar with Jason Grant's obsession with, uh, well, he's got many, but the, his obsession with the notion of wall carpet, particularly over at the Land Pavilion. He took that one step further in this presentation by digging up a memo to Marty Sklar from somebody who was actually purchasing wall carpet from, uh, I can't remember what country, uh, overseas, in China, 
Thailand, something like that. Uh, and and uh, it actually mentioned specifically wall carpet in the memo, which he thought was uh, a, a fairly proud moment for uh, for him. And of course, wall carpet is fun. You can touch it, and it's fuzzy and colorful and interesting designs and uh, and all of that. Uh, so they went uh, sort of on and on with the with the bizarre uh, stories like that, looking at just uh, details you may not even realize are around the park. Another interesting uh, uh, bizarre story shared by Jason Grant was uh, when his uh, young niece was with him in the Norway Stave Church uh, uh, recently and looked at the sort of static human figures in there and asked, are they real? And uh, Jason Grant's reply was, no, they aren't real humans, because if they were, uh, the glass wouldn't hold them in when they reanimate as zombies. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, that's the type of presentation this went, and it was amusing, it was entertaining, it was funny at times. Uh, Not necessarily the most informative, but I'm sure that was not the intent from the beginning. Uh, Moving on. From there, uh, next presentation was We've Just Begun to Dream. Uh, Live entertainment presentation. Uh, First uh, introducing himself was Ron Logan, a music director that was there around the time of the early days of Epcot. And more panelists uh, also came out and joined him. He noted that live entertainment is cheaper and faster than Walt Disney Imagineering. They could put uh, shows together a lot more quickly and for less uh, money uh, than it took to build a ride or or something like that. Uh, So they were always present at openings and groundbreakings and all of all of that kind of thing uh overall this presentation was not necessarily the most uh most entertaining of the bunch at this d23 event it was probably the one that uh, most people kind of spaced out a little bit uh, while watching though there were some interesting tidbits like knowing that on uh, opening day of uh, Epcot uh, during the opening ceremonies that is the uh, big Epcot fountain the famous dancing fountain wasn't quite done so uh, Ron Logan actually had to cue the plumbers to make the fountain do its thing rather than having it be all automated and special and all of that so uh, anyway uh, moving on from there to the next presentation was one uh, I found to be particularly fascinating uh, called Epcot Illusioneering and Beyond this was hosted by a uh, a guy I was not familiar with but now I am and I am glad I am Uh, his name, uh, he's an Imagineer, of course, he, named uh, Daniel Joseph. He works uh, on special effects and the illusions department of Imagineering. And illusioneering is not something you hear all that often, though it has been around for years and years and years. If, in fact, thinking all the way back to like the development of the Haunted Mansion, uh, uh, Joseph's, uh, Daniel Joseph's sort of idol was Yale Gracie, of course, lent his name to Master Gracie and all of that. But he really worked on many of the illusions that you find throughout the Haunted Mansion, uh, as well as uh, uh, many others throughout his History also developed uh, interesting illusions, as they like to call them. Illusions basically different from like an animatronic figure or a practical effect. Illusion was something that you can look at right in front of you and think, wow, what is that? How did they do that? Um, That's an illusion. So uh, they also noted uh, a name, Bob McCarthy. They called him the wizard, and uh, he was uh, inventing special effects and illusions uh, for attractions, including the use of smells and attractions like horizons uh there's uh, you know there's fire there's lava there's ghosts there's fiber optics all that kind of thing was uh or just a variety of types of uh effects that they came up with um uh, uh daniel joseph also mentioned a bit more about horizons as i said it's kind of an ongoing theme throughout this day of epcot presentations and he talked about the early mock-ups of uh, horizons ride vehicle uh of course it was a very unique vehicle a suspended omni mover system and uh very interesting there one other note uh, two no- two other notes actually well Let's make that three other notes from this presentation. One is that apparently Journey into Imagination was the first uh, attraction to sort of pioneer the use of uh, on-ride photography. Uh, to take your photo while you're on the ride. I thought that was particularly interesting. Uh, Also worth noting is there are some great fiber optics in the uh, Maelstrom attraction over in Norway. And apparently, initially, Imagineers had considered using a Tesla coil. And uh, they decided that Tesla coil was probably not the safest thing to have in a water ride, uh, particularly, uh, or even around guests at all. So fiber optics were used instead. Final note is uh, Daniel Joseph is now working on the uh, update to uh, Test Track, Test Track 2.0, which he said will have plenty of cool special effects in it. 
And obviously I'm blasting through these uh, very, very quickly. There are many more details that were shared uh, throughout. Uh, two more presentations to go. This is a full day of presentations I'm talking about here in a very short amount of time. Uh, the next presentation was all about Journey into Imagination. No photography whatsoever was allowed in this one. It was hosted by, uh, once again, archivist Stephen Vagnini, but also joined by Imagineer Tony Baxter, who was certainly instrumental in the development of the uh, original Journey into Imagination attraction, which uh, everybody loves with Dreamfinder and Figment, but that's not even where they started. Baxter actually pulled back a little bit, started by talking about the Seas Pavilion that never was. They didn't have enough money to build what the concepts that he had developed, and he shared some of those, uh, I believe, at Destination D last year as well, so not entirely new material there. Uh, then he moved on to talking about the Land Pavilion, which again did not get built as Tony Baxter had designed, so he was kind of 0 for 2 at that point, uh, but he did manage to work some of those elements ultimately into the Imagination Pavilion, specifically this uh, notion of a character called the Land Keeper uh, later became the Dream Finder. Very similar character. There was actually a concept for Disneyland called Discovery Bay that was never built. That was from uh, Imagineer Steve Kirk, and uh, he had designed a pair of characters, one with a beard and holding a dragon in his hand, and of course that uh, that character was actually named Professor Marvel at the time, which, well, you know how that wouldn't uh, exactly work, especially today in Disney owning Marvel and all of that. Um, this was a more of a Victorian character uh, drawn around 1980. In fact, Baxter noted that uh, perhaps they had invented steampunk, uh, steampunk without, uh, without even realizing it, uh, but ultimately that did become the dream finder but then they weren't sure what to call this little dragon they were working on until one day baxter was sitting at home watching magnum pi of all shows and uh, one of the characters on there which they showed this clip at uh, at this event they showed a clip of a character in the show saying something 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 figment of my imagination and that's where it sort of dawned on tony baxter to call it Figment. Uh, it was originally going to be a green dragon. Figment was. Uh, Kodak, the sponsor of the attraction, didn't like that. Uh, green apparently was a color of one of their competitors. They were leaning towards red and yellow. That was their colors, but they didn't really... Disney didn't want a red dragon or a yellow dragon, so they settled with the complete opposite color of green purple, and the Sherman Brothers really made that uh, work with their lyric royal purple pigment, of course, uh, but they did give them a yellow and, uh, and red outfit in honor of, uh, of Kodak. And uh, ultimately, uh, of course, they settled on uh, Billy Barty as the voice of Figment after trying a variety of, uh, of things and, and moved on and developed uh, the entirety of the uh, imagination, uh, Journey into Imagination attraction. I thought this note was uh, particularly interesting as well. I had never heard this before. Uh, Tony Baxter said there were three parts of that ride that were supposed to be sort of roller coaster style segments where you would drop quickly, you know, kind of similar to the drop in Pirates of the Caribbean, but without the uh, the water. And they were going to be in the terror, the science, and the on-ride photo section, but uh, apparently the ride system simply wouldn't let them do what they wanted to do. So after telling all of those stories of the creation of Journey into Imagination, uh, they were joined by two other guys on stage who were very important in the history of this attraction, uh, Ron Schneider and Steve Taylor. Both were uh, very good friends with Dreamfinder, as they like to put it. Uh, Ron Schneider first uh, took the microphone and told the story of how he became uh, Dreamfinder, first working in the Golden Horseshoe out at Disneyland, and then ultimately working his way uh, through some friends and through some experiences and, and blah blah blah, and eventually got to uh, embody uh, a Dreamfinder and, and become very good friends with him. And uh, he also offered the advice, he said he gets asked all the time, how do you get a job like that? How do I get a job like that? Well, his uh, recommendation for everybody was to to, as he put it, follow your bliss. He said, uh, you should get a job at Disney. Didn't matter what job, doesn't matter what job you get. Just get in the company and sort of make those connections. And then once you've been there for a while, get out of the company, train yourself for the job that you want to do in Disney, and then find your way back in. That was his suggestion. And then Steve Taylor, the other friend of Dreamfinder, piped in and said, well, yeah, that's essentially what he did. He started by sweeping the floors for a while. He was a few other roles in a parade and other friends with characters and, uh, you know, friends with Mickey Mouse, friends with uh, Winnie the Pooh. He had a lot of friends at Disney. And, uh, but then he left the company and uh, went elsewhere and then ultimately came, uh, came back and, uh, and uh, got to know Dreamfinder pretty well. And uh, in the end, this presentation ended with a fun virtual sort of quote-unquote ride through the original Journey into Imagination via artwork and video and sounds and music. A very well-assembled sort of virtual type of uh, embody the spirit of the attraction as opposed to just a straight, you know, ride-through uh, video. No mention, of course, was uh, made of any return of Dreamfinder or uh, anything to that effect or even a makeover of the ride, uh, but it was still uh, fairly amusing. And in the end, they had a special surprise ending for everybody who was there. 
there, they showed a uh, photo of everybody in the audience up on the screen as if it was an on-ride photo, and Ron Schneider did the Dreamfinder voice there live uh, in person, which was, uh, which was a nice treat. And then one more presentation remained at that point as a, uh, I wouldn't call it a grand finale, it was just sort of one last presentation, and it was on the music of, uh, of Epcot, which of course, you know, I'm playing plenty of it on this week's show. Music has been a huge part of Epcot, so much to be a fan of in the, uh, in the world of music over the years uh, at Epcot. And this uh, panel was uh, particularly interesting in that it featured uh, Russell Brower, who was the uh, co-writer on the music for The Living Seas uh, with George Wilkins. He also uh, wrote uh, Inventions Plaza music, which I'll, uh, I'll switch to some of that here. Uh, that is still being played today. And, uh, and they kind of went through, along with uh, a Greg Airbar, who uh, wrote the uh, Mouse Tracks, I believe the name of the book is, about Disney music and has uh, sort of been a fan of it all. Also up on stage were Tim O'Day once again, along with Stephen Bagnini once again. And they just kind of went through the history of what uh, Disney music has been all about at Epcot. A variety of composers like uh, Buddy Baker and, and songwriters uh, Exitensio sh uh, shared some clips from Kitchen Cabaret. I uh, talked about the Sherman Brothers for a little while even played uh, Joe Rohde, uh, Imagineer Joe Rohde, of course, most famous from uh, Animal Kingdom, uh, sort of doing a scratch track for Dreamfinder before they had a, uh, a voice there. And then they, uh, they shared the notion that uh, Magic Journeys was, uh, is actually uh, Marty Sklar's favorite Sherman Brothers song, which is, uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so then they talked a little bit more about Horizons and uh, George Wilkins' music there. And of course, they've got great songs like... Always great to hear old Epcot music like that, and that's what they were talking about for so long. And then they went on for a uh, sort of a special double performance to conclude the entire day of uh, Epcot presentations. Uh, they shared a song that was uh, sort of an unused Horizon song, and it was sung in person there at the event by uh, D uh, D23's armchair archivist, Melody Dale, which I had no idea she could sing, but apparently she can, and she does very well. She sang the song called Tomorrow's Windows, uh, not to be confused with Tomorrow's Child. Um, but uh, so she sang that, and uh, and then ultimately the uh, the grand finale of the event uh, seemed awfully familiar, especially to anybody who had been uh, been to Destination D Walt Disney World last year, which had the wonderful finale uh, featuring Richard Sherman and an excellent concert. Well, this time around, it was much, much smaller. Uh, longtime performer from Epcot, Billy Flanagan, came out and sang a bit of, uh, of Golden Dreams, which, uh, of course, is always a, a touching song to hear around... Uh, around Epcot. Uh, everybody loves that song from the, uh, the American Adventure. Um, but, uh, you know, it was kind of kind of odd to repeat that same, essentially the same performance, though much smaller scale as, uh, as last time around. So that was uh, sort of a surprise that was not necessarily the best surprise, but it was, at least it was a little something at the end. And it was also set to sort of a nice tribute to Walt Disney and showing, sort of wrapping up his vision of Epcot. And in the very, very end, there was one more video they wanted to share. It was an internal video, as they called it, uh, in which they uh, essentially, it was Marty Sklar and Card Walker and a few others who were instrumental to uh, the creation of Epcot and the leadership across its creation. And really uh, finally exclaiming in that style of the we can do it attitude, they ultimately said, we did it. And they were done with the project. And uh, they were, of course, thrilled with uh, with that notion of actually being uh, complete with Epcot and, and finishing. While it may not have been exactly what Walt Disney's own vision of uh, Epcot Center, uh, or rather the Epcot, uh, Epcot uh, Experimental Prototype Community, the Tonner, uh, community of tomorrow became Epcot Center, the theme park. Not exactly the same, the same thing, um, but certainly uh, uh, something they could be proud of and has lived on for many years and has certainly uh, had many, many fans that were really excited to celebrate it uh, during this D23 event. 
So before I get into those interviews that I mentioned earlier, I do have to step away here from Epcot for just a moment to put in a quick word about Theme Park Connection. Now, if you are an Epcot fan, you've enjoyed everything I was just talking about, you can actually own a piece of Epcot, a piece of the Magic Kingdom, a piece of all the Disney parks, or even uh, all kinds of collectibles and merchandise and signs and props and all that kind of thing. Theme Park Connection sells all of that. I don't know where they get it all from, but their selection is incredible. They've got a store uh, out here in Winter garden florida about 10 15 minutes north of the magic kingdom and uh there you'll find uh, all those items that i mentioned you can browse and purchase of course you can also head to their website themeparkconnection.com and there on the website is where you'll find directions to their store store hours but also a link to their online store uh, via ebay and uh, that store will uh will give you the opportunity to buy even more online so check it all out over at themeparkconnection.com so now I do want to uh, bring uh, to you a, a, th- well, a trio of interviews. Really, these are three very interesting uh, men who are part of the panels that I just talked about uh, throughout the day, uh, the D23 Epcot 30th presentation, and they each have their own sort of unique take on what it was like to be there and uh, be instrumental in the creation of Epcot, all in their completely unique roles, which I will actually let them introduce themselves as well as explain to you what they did rather than me going on and on here. So now... Uh, join me back over at Epcot Inside the World Showplace for uh, for three interviews with some uh, some very very unique and uh, and interesting gentlemen, and then I'll I'll catch you on the other side. My name is Howard Rowland, and uh, I was uh, a vice president of the Walt Disney Company, and my responsibility at Epcot was I would say it was more the fiduciary responsibility, uh, but I had responsibility for all of the contracting for Epcot, uh, and uh, I say contracting, the construction contracting. So the program and what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, my team developed all that uh, actually even way before construction started. So looking back, we're here, you know, 30 years after opening, sort of in, in remembering your time and working on, on Epcot up till opening day, what would you think would have been like the most challenging, the most sort of memorable part of, of the development? I, I think there were two, two major phases that at least I was involved in. A was uh, sitting with the uh, then President Card and Don and Ron Miller, who was Walt's son-in-law, when they made the decision to go ahead. And uh, so the first moment for me was when we, when I knew that one of my major responsibilities was going to be uh, putting the program together, how we were going to do it, and what that would entail, and also to start to develop uh, what one would call the pre-construction activities where you you knew you had a pavilion estimate how much that pavilion was going to cost and so that was to me a very challenging moment and i realized as i mentioned earlier that i didn't think that we had the ability internally to do that so uh, I was able to get Don and Card and other members of the board to agree that we could go and find somebody that can help us with the process. And I think the background for that was that the problems, uh, just so you understand, uh, the construction manager, the people that ran the construction originally at Disney World were the same people that did uh uh, uh, Disneyland in California. So there were relationships already developed between Disney World and Disneyland, the people. So I felt very strongly at the time that we had to find another way. And uh, that was my first major assignment. So I imagine, you know, approaching that, how do you even begin to figure out, you know, what does it take to develop something on this incredible scale? I mean, Epcot's obviously a lot bigger than Disneyland or the Magic Kingdom. You know, how well, do- it wasn't really. I think maybe it was the same size. When I say size, it, it took the same amount of planning, although I, was, I didn't come to the company until 69. So I was here basically for the building of the Contemporary and Polynesian Hotel. 
so I, I, don't, I think that the complexity, because of the time, this was not 1953, it was not 1969 or 71, and the complexity changed. And it was the first time that uh, we we had to bring the unions into it, in, into EPCOT, and there was no, Florida was a right-to-work state. So the unions wanted that foothold, and we were obligated to help them. So that in itself, I knew, was going to present major problems. So I felt that if we had a buffer, some buffer, between Disney and uh, the builders and the unions, that that would save us from getting involved in a lot of things perhaps we didn't want to get involved in, and as a company, were we capable of getting involved? So at that point, I used that to discourage management from uh, uh, using the same organization that built Disneyland and Disney World, and I was able to go out and find, as I mentioned earlier, I ended up recommending, and uh, with a group of us, we decided on Tishman. So the presentation you were just on was called, you know, we can do it. That was sort of the motto at the time. Is is it was that really the feeling that was going around? You mentioned you, you had to go and find outside companies, etc. But was it all sort of just part of like this is something we are capable of doing? I, I think we had no choice but to follow through on that because a lot of people, you got to understand at the time it was the largest privately uh, funded construction in the world. So you had to find people that would buy into that. And I got to be honest, in, in the beginning, uh, I would travel all over the country trying to find contractors to agree to come down here and bid on work. And uh, a lot of them said, we're not interested in building another Mickey Mouse village. And uh, so it was a problem. So that we can do was a philosophy that we had to carry through the whole uh, uh, I don't think people believed it, so we, if we didn't say it, nobody was going to believe it. How much of a focus was there during sort of the development and the construction on fulfilling, at least in part, what Walt had envisioned? Uh, obviously, it's a very different project, but, you know, how much of that was, was sort of keeping in mind? A lot of the people that were involved in the, uh, in the planning, the show that was going to be put on, they... They, and I'm working out of memory here, but they were, majority of them were the same people that uh, worked on Disneyland and Disney World. So they, they had to take that and bring it into a much larger scale, into pavilions. And that, that was a major major problem because again as a company we were still small and in we had a design group and a storytelling group that could tell stories and design things that you can't imagine how do you get that now into the process of, of finding people that can do that and and do it the way they wanted to and that was that was the biggest task out there, really. Yeah, I mean, well, that's always been the basis of, of the theme park experience, certainly the basis of, you know, whether it's movies or the theme parks or everything, there's always that, that storytelling element. How did that sort of integrate with the, the construction side of it? Well, it, it was, this is on film, <laughs> it, was, it was very, very difficult because uh, my, my responsibility, as I said, was the contracting. So I had to guide Tishman into dealing with all of these issues. And I explained earlier that the Imagineers imagined what they wanted. Very difficult to put it down on a drawing. I mean, you could look at the models and say, oh, this is how we're going to build it. Well, what the hell, are you, I mean, what really, what are we talking about? Can you get this down on a piece of paper that we could give it to whatever contract? And the answer was, basically no. So we had to start building without knowing fully what the internal shows were going to be. So we'd start with four walls and 
the engineers or the Imagineers would say, well, we need this kind of space. Okay, then you talk to the food people, we need this kind of space. So you determine that the space needed is 200,000 square feet. I'm just using, and so you build four walls. Right. So, and you hope to hell that you, the shows are going to fit in right. So you, I could go back to Japan as an example. We didn't have a show yet in mind for Japan. I don't know if there was ever a show there. No. Right. So now we had an area that we knew was going to put a show in someday, but there was nothing there. Well, this became typical because you're telling a contractor, well, you got to bring so much wire in, you got to do this, you got to do that, and they do, but then we never we never used it. No, it's interesting you bring up that Japan Pavilion. It's always one of those things that fans wonder, what is that big building sitting back there doing nothing? I mean, did you fully you know flesh that out with all the wires and everything necessary well, for? I, I imagine this. Still there, right? Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, and I'll just digress for one minute. It became the site that the show was supposed to go in became a holding pen, and the holding pen was because one of the, the one of the contractors that was involved in the building. So that would allow uh, took the money we gave him and left. No, because hmm. you have to be ran away with his secretary. I don't know who the hell he ran away with. So now he's gone, and the, we, they can't meet the payrolls because the money's gone. So I, I got a call. It was a Friday night, and I got a call from security, and they said, Howard, we got a problem. The unions have called the strike, and they're using the Japanese pavilion. So I said, well, where are they? And he says, well, we've got them in where the show's going to go. I said, okay, I'll go and, and talk to them. So I went, and, and the problem was that uh, because they weren't paid that Friday night, they demanded to be put on the clock at that time. Well, put on the clock means now they're all going at the time and a half. So I went to the union and said, hey, look, I will take care of this, but you can't stay here, and I'm not going to pay overtime for you doing nothing. So we got into a, a hassle, and finally I just said, hey, guys, it's your call. I'm not hanging around whenever you decide that you want to get paid, you give me all the hours, I'll have the accounting take care of it. And they stayed there for two days and I refused to pay them. Uh, and eventually we won out because the employees started to leave there. Well, uh, what am I hanging around for? So that was the only time that that room was ever used. It was the third floor. I mean, I don't know what's there now. What's the matter? Well, let me ask you one more quick question then. Uh, walking around Epcot today, it's, you know, obviously a lot has changed, but a lot around World Showcase has stayed very much the same since initially. Does that surprise you, or is it that a testament to what was designed? Well, I, I just think, no, it doesn't surprise me because uh, I made trips. Uh, I, I had to, one of my responsibilities as a vice president is I had Israel and Morocco as, as countries that I was trying to bring in. Uh, this is probably before we started building. And I, I couldn't get Israel and I couldn't get Morocco. I finally did. But it, I knew the problems we were going to have because a lot of the com companies didn't want to pay the fee to come in. They, they needed to go to outside beer companies and rest, whatever. So I, I felt that no matter what, it was going to take time. And so, no, it doesn't surprise me. Tom Navi, and uh, I worked for PICO. PICO is a uh, acronym called uh, uh, Project Coordination Office, and my, my job and responsibility was I ran the uh, storage warehouse for everything that we bought, built, or, or uh, uh, manufactured for installation. Uh, in Epcot uh, or it was di direct delivered to the site and I had people to meet the trucks and, and uh, uh, ensure that the items that came off were in uh, proper condition and if they weren't then they got repaired or, or uh, what was needed. Okay. Now your, your time with the Walt Disney Company dates very far back. What was your, uh, your first role at, at Disney? I was, a, I was a newspaper boy on Main Street at Disneyland. 
Correct. Uh, I started out my career, and uh, during that time frame, uh, somebody had mentioned to me that Walt was going to build Tom Sawyer's Island uh, in Frontierland, so I, I uh, looked up Walt because he was in the park quite frequently and introduced myself and told him I looked just like Tom Sawyer and he should hire me to be Tom Sawyer on Tom Sawyer's Island. And of course, he did. Uh, be, but but the one thing he did, he, he said he'd think about it. He didn't say no. If he'd said no, that had been the end of the conversation. But he said he'd think about it. So I'm, I'm a very persistent person. <laughs> okay? Uh, and so I, uh, anytime Walt was in the park and I had the opportunity to uh, run him down, uh, I'd ask him if he was still thinking about hiring me to be Tom Sawyer. I remember one of the conversations that we had that he said he could... Uh, uh, put a put a mannequin or a dummy, one or the other, over there that wouldn't be leaving every five minutes for a hot dog and coke. Uh, but once they finished Tom Sawyer's Island in, in uh, June of 1956, uh, Walt pretty much looked at me. He was coming off the island uh, and uh, 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 met him at that time frame, and he said, you still want to be Tom Sawyer? And I said, yes. And he said, okay, get a work permit and a social security card, and the minute you do that, I'll put you to work as Tom Sawyer. So that's where I started. Started. Uh, and then uh, eventually Tom Sawyer grew up. Right. Okay. So I had uh, I uh, operated every ride and attraction at Disneyland with the exception of the steam train and monorail because those were operated by Redlaw. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, in turn, uh, I, I, I had to leave for a little bit during the Vietnam War and I uh, joined the Marine Corps, so I was gone. Uh, of, of 64, 65, returned in 68. So I, I was gone when Walt passed. No, no, uh, Which uh, and and uh, I was gone during the the New York World's Fair time frame. Uh, but then I got back uh, there and uh, had the opportunity to join uh, the opening crew for Walt Disney World. Uh, so went through the opening of Walt Disney World, and then I had the uh, opportunity to uh, join the uh, opening crew for Epcot. Uh, and uh, uh, pretty much performed the same role. I opened the monorail system uh, for Walt Disney World, so I, I had a pretty good background on, on uh, 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 ride systems and ride development, uh, and that's uh, how I ended up in the uh, in the warehouse system. Uh, uh, and it was sort of an easy transition mm -hmm. uh, because uh, in, instead of I, I sort of looked at it as moving items instead of people. But I was very, very coordinated in right. moving people through through the park and, and all the things that you had to do with that. And I sort of took that same approach to the warehouse side of the business. It's sort of like running in the parking lot, except you needed to know the exact space that every car was parked in and how many people were in that car and the name of the driver that was in that car. It was the only difference along that line. So, yeah, we're, we're obviously here at uh, Epcot's 30th anniversary, thinking back 30 years ago, organizing all of that was there like one moment that stands out to you as being sort of the most challenging frustrating which is even memorable you know instance of, of something going on in your department oh, I, well I, I had several of those uh, the, 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 the problem that I had is 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 that we were still building Epcot uh, when, uh, when October 1 rolled around so you know during the during the day, it was go in, go out to the warehouse and work for three four hours, and come in and, and to the park and see what was going on, and then try to attend some of the uh, uh, functions and, and benefits and enjoy that. But know that I had to be back at the warehouse at six o'clock the next morning. Uh, I, uh, one of the most challenging uh, uh, time frames that we had was uh, on on Spaceship Earth. I think was one of them because of the elaborate set pieces and show pieces uh, in that uh, in that pavilion and what was happening was they were running a little behind in finishing off the entire skin of, of the building and what we had was we had a big opening in the bottom that we could lift things up into the ball uh, and so what we decided to do is take all I want to say there's 21 different sets in 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 the uh, 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 show uh, and so we, in turn, took everything out of the warehouse, took it out at night, and, and we loaded in every night until we had all 20 sets in, and stored up inside 
uh, the the uh, 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 a final show uh, segment, and then in turn, uh, then we uh, had to get everything then moved down and in place for for show installation. Uh, but that was that one was very challenging. I can imagine. But they but it, they had to close up the exterior of the, uh, of the building because right. they were behind schedule. Yeah, I, when walking around the park now, going on Spaceship Earth, going on any of the other attractions, do you still sort of have those you know flashbacks to seeing? Oh, I remember that in the warehouse and trying to get that into the building. Thing and oh yeah, yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know some of them were sort of uh, sort of unusual. I, uh, I remember one morning driving driving to the warehouse and there was this flatbed truck out there and and had a had what what I would call a uh, a, a grain silo on it and and, and a very large uh, uh, conveyor uh, mechanism and I'm looking I go boy that's a that's a a, 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 a silo and a and a, uh, and a, a, a grain auger and, and go, what in the world you know, do we use this? And, and, and the driver had no idea what he had. Right. Yeah, other than this is where he was going to deliver it. So I finally got to the paperwork and, and opened it up and called the coordinator, uh, who was Tom Turley, uh, for the land pavilion. And uh, it was in the in the desert scene, the, the sand that was blowing. Okay, it well, would we'll blow over into a collection bin and the collection bin this auger oh, okay. would take it back up and right. put it in the silo and then the silo would in turn drop the sand down so the so the wind could blow the sand down through this uh, the, the sink but but that was sort of one of those okay yeah, yeah. Uh, that, 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 that you look at it and you go well I know what it is but I don't know how it's going to be used <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. So uh, in, in walking around now 30 years later, obviously you've been sort of done with Epcot for, for a while. Do you still feel any you know, sense of accomplishment seeing that so many people still enjoying it all these years later? Uh, absolutely. Out of, out of the parks, I'm probably in Epcot more uh, than any of them. Uh, you know, the Magic Kingdom has its, its place, and I love the Magic Kingdom, but I, 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 like, I like Epcot, and I, I like Epcot during the holiday seasons, uh, especially with World Showcase mm -hmm. and uh, along the uh, time frame with the uh, candlelight procession and that. So uh, yes, I, I enjoy it. I, I, I love the uh, the uh, uh, food and wine festival. Oh, yeah. We come out every year for the food, food and wine festival and our eat our way around the uh, 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 the, the lagoon. So uh, uh, yes, it's 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 a very enjoyable part. I know this is the most difficult question to answer, but you knew Walt Disney at least in a, in a little bit um, in some level uh, do you think he would be thrilled to be walking around here today I, I, I think so uh, you know Walt, uh, Walt changed and uh, when he needed to change and and, and regroup uh, along that line uh, you know he, he always said that money was the vehicle uh, to create dreams and imaginations and, and but 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 the company went through some major transitions uh, uh, through that time frame and and I, 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 I think uh, maybe a little bit more uh, involvement in, in uh, uh, the concept because Walt was really focused around that Epcot portion of it. Um, uh, so, so there may have been a little bit of different direction. But overall, I, I think hard built uh, uh, for, for Walt's uh, uh, memory of what he thought Walt wanted. My name is Jim McCaskill, and my original role at Epcot was uh, senior designer, electronics, and all the uh, AMSES systems and fire systems. Are you, are you still with Disney? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm still here, but not with Disney. Okay. I'm, I'm actually with uh, Siemens Corporation, oh, okay. working Spaceship Earth. I'm the director of the I'm conference facility there now, the, uh, my retirement job. <laughs> I was just in the uh, Siemens lounge the other day. It's very, very cushy the, in there. For the um, Mickey 3D. Uh, well, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I was, that, I was okay. there. Okay, excellent. Um, so thinking back 30 years, obviously, uh, Epcot history, when you think back to your initial sort of work uh, on, on all the variety of pavilions, what stands out to you as maybe the, the moment that sort of captures the, the spirit of the time? Is there one particular story that you would that you would share? Well, that's that's a little. The 
there were so many moments. Right. From the very What's first moment I stepped on Epcot you grounds was to consult. You know, I'm a hot air balloonist, or was then. I and I was brought out to look at the site to see if we could use balloons to represent pavilions so the press could turn around and get an idea how big the project was. So I coordinated that. We just had a Hurricane David come through a month, less than a month before that, so it was a pure swamp. So that was my first exposure to it. I was working for Walt Disney World Engineering. I loved it so much, the concept. I said, i got to get on this project, and I did. And I guess the, the pivotal moment for me was all the hard work we did. I mean, it wasn't just Disney people. It was contractors. I mean, supply people. It, it was a true team of thousands and thousands of people. And my job allowed me to work with all of them. It was opening day, and I got to go stand at the front gate and watch the gates open, watch the people come in. And I had my whole electronics crew with me. We just stood there to see him come in. That moment, we knew we did it. Yeah. And that was that was the key moment for me. Yeah. Well, the panel that we just wrapped up, we can do it. Was the you know the spirit of that? Um, how much of that did you personally embody? You know, what did you take out of that sort of motto and and make sure that you know everything got done basically? I don't know exactly where it came from. I, I mean, I've been with Disney since 1971. I, I, that's when I started as an electronics training, you know, but an at Epcot there was a feeling so that we had to do it, and, and I don't know, it's the leadership, maybe that was where it started, but it was, again, the teamwork was unbelievable, you didn't want any let anybody down next to you, so you continue to drive forward. I mentioned earlier that we uh, were on five days a week, that five days a week when we first started, and once we started getting pavilions out of the ground, the engineering group went six days a week, the last year we were on seven days a week, working 12 to 18 hours a day, and I mean, I'm when I say seven, I really mean it. There were nights you stayed all night, you know. So I, I don't know how to answer that except that I, I was inspired by the people I worked with. Right. So walking around here today, you must still have some sort of sense of accomplishment. You know, every time I walk through and see, you know, look at the pavilions, and I like to go look at the new things they're doing, and that's that's really fun. Uh, but my favorite is running across people who said I was here in '81 and or '82, excuse me, and they would tell a story and they talk about a pavilion and maybe it's changed so much you wouldn't recognize it today. And it's so much fun to be able to reminisce with them on that. Today, sitting in the audience and watching some of the videos has brought back so many memories of building the living seas and building horizons and those type of things. So I've enjoyed it. Well, I'm sure as you heard from sitting here, Horizons certainly is a fan favorite, very very much missed. Uh, Mission Space is great, but Horizons so it was something special. Can you sort of share any interesting uh, tidbits about the, the construction there or the, you know your involvement in that particular project? Again, mine was more facilities uh, well, right. related. Uh, I think the biggest thing there was that orange smell. Every, I mean, when they started putting the smellerizers in, all the construction group, when can they turn that thing off? Because every day you walked in and it was just so orange in there. And that was probably the thing that had everybody going nuts. Uh, but the, the fun thing was the first time we were seeing some of those big images of the space shuttle lifting off and things like that. Uh, the presentation techniques, it would stop workers and you know, when we were doing testing, it would just stop all construction so they could watch that. That was fun. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, the, the Soren attraction that's here now and is also in California. I remember hearing a story of an Imagineer that worked on that, that they have smells integrated there and they accidentally left them on sort of continuously overnight one night and they had to just completely air out the building. But of course, thinking back on that orange smell now on Horizons, it's definitely one of those sort of magical Disney moments. It was like, almost like the smoke smell in Spaceship Earth. Yeah. You know, where the burning room and ruins are going on and, it, it, you know, if, if you let that run too long, and, and it takes over the whole building. So they, they got to be very careful about how they tune that up. And, but when they're first learning, you know, we can that's the key. Right. Is uh, they're learning how it's going to work, and everybody that's working here, like, what's burning in this place? Or you know, where's the orange tree? Who <laughs> cut the orange tree down? So. In in walking around the park now, riding the rides, etc. Do you still see a lot of your your team, your own work? You know, that's still here. My work. Yeah. My, oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, but I have to walk backstage a lot of times to see my stuff. But yes, I I still see stuff. Uh, I've been working with some of the phone companies. 
companies and you know I put in all the phone cut panels and all that and designed the conduit for that so a lot of times even in my own pavilion now spaceship earth somebody will come in from the phone company who's never been here and I need to find this and they'll come by our facility and they'll say what they're looking for I say wait a minute I know where that is let me take you so off through the building we go and I'll take them to the location because I know it so well so, so were you involved in the uh, recent spaceship earth sort of makeover update I, I was hired by Siemens just as they came in to work with them with Imagineers because I'm, when when you're a corporation coming in not every corporation speaks Disney and, and it is like a different language and that's where I was trying to help them is to step in and, and, and look at how things are presented now they, they have their own culture too that they want presented uh, but when Disney said we can't do something or we'd rather do it this way I was able to interpret that for them to their language so that it made sense for them. Was that sort of a, a weird moment to having worked on it years ago and then come back and oh it's you know version 2.0 now? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it, and, and I love what they've done with it. I mean the Imagineers uh, going to California and doing the no, testing no, on different uh, pieces just, they were doing, uh, seeing some of the creative ideas. I thought they were creative 30 years ago. Right. The stuff they're doing now is as a technical person just it blows the mind and it's so much fun to see the research of what's coming next. Yeah. That's I really enjoy that part. Yeah, the, the updated audio animatronics figures in there are astounding. Uh, the second half obviously has changed dramatically with the addition of the, the touch screens. Um, sort of thinking back to that part of the ride years ago, was there ever an indication like, oh, this is going to be something that's going to be continuously updated, or was it like, this is what we're building now, not even you know thinking toward the future? You mean the original spaceship? Yeah, exactly. I, I think they thought it was going to be like it was. And uh, obviously, especially the post show coming down the, the down ramp, um, it had to be changed. It, it had to be updated because technology was moving so fast that it you know would have looked old in five years. So, yeah, it was, and, it, and I think Siemens and Disney are going to look at it again as we move forward. What else can be changed to make it even better? Now, the video touchscreens help facilitate that to where you can make an easier change faster in questions or how you present it. I mean, after they open, you only had a snapshot is what you were sent in your email. And the demand of the public was so much, I love the video, how do I get the video? So we went back and worked with the Imagineers to find where we could store memory to hold these images for at least, you know, a day right. so we can email it out every night. So it's always changing, and hopefully it always will. Well, speaking of change, so you walk around 30 years Epcot, uh, 30 years later at Epcot now, do you, do you find it interesting to sort of note what has changed, what has not changed, what's exactly the same? You know? Yes, yes. I, I do that all day. I have, like anybody else, I have guests who come out here and I have to walk them around, and some of them, they've only been here once or twice, some have never been here, and that's the ones I enjoy most. Yeah. And then, well, well, I heard of this, well, it's not there anymore, you know, so it's, right. yeah, we're always looking at it and changing. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. That is where we are going to wrap up show 391. Uh, certainly, I hope you enjoyed all of the uh, coverage of D23's Epcot 30th anniversary event. Of course, uh, as the Epcot saying goes, we've only just begun because, uh, well, Disney is putting on some additional entertainment uh, today, October 1st. Uh, uh, I'm actually recording this very late at night on Sunday, carrying over into October 1st. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, how many or if I will be attending any of the, uh, the daytime presentations that is weekday after all i do have other things uh, going on uh, but if i do make it to any of those i will try to share those on uh, next week's show of course i've skipped listener feedback uh, as well uh, this week i'm going to hold all of that for next week and i have a feeling that's really what i'm going to focus on next week is just trying to catch up on that once again have another fun uh, listener feedback focused show because i certainly have been getting so many great emails that i definitely want to get to and uh, and share here so uh, continue to send them in if you got your questions comments etc i'll uh, continue to file them away and uh, get them ready for uh, for inclusion uh, very soon for another round of, of Q&A. Uh, yeah. So uh, thanks very much, uh, of course, to Magical Travel for sponsoring this week's episode of Inside the Magic. You can find out more about their services by visiting MagicalTravel.com. Uh, also, I do want to thank uh, uh, the folks over at Ubisoft for uh, joining us as a new sponsor here on the show. Of course, you heard the uh, the dance break earlier. That's going to become a, a sort of a regular segment here on the show, share some uh, extra fun music as we move, uh, move on in the coming weeks. Weeks uh, in promotion of Just Dance 
Disney Party, uh, which will be coming out uh, on uh, Xbox 360 and the Wii on October 23rd. And, of course, thanks to uh, Theme Park Connection. Uh, find out more about uh, their wonderful stores uh, online as well as in person over at ThemeParkConnection.com. That's where you can find all kinds of great Disney collectibles and rarities. Uh, and, of course, I didn't actually put in a, a specific ad about my own company, Lanyard Lab, so I'll do that now. LanyardLab.com is the place you want to go if you uh, need some custom lanyards. I'll just... That's it. That's all I got to say about that. Uh, of course, we've got our own website for this show, InsideTheMagic.net. It's not just for this show, uh, but it's for uh, everything Disney and theme park uh, related, all kinds of news and all, all that good stuff. So head on over to the website. Uh, that's about it for this week. Thanks for listening and for watching. Have a magical week. Bye. Just a dream away.